Hi everyone, um, my name is Bella. I'm a pediatric allergist uh, and immunologist and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you this evening and for giving me your Thursday uh, night. Um, so today I'm going to be giving a talk about COVID-19, um, Kawasaki disease and inflammatory disorders which are a recognised feature in some patients uh, with COVID-19. Uh, in terms of my background, I'm a paediatric allergist and immunologist. I went to Melbourne University and did most of my training through the Royal Children's Hospital uh, down in Melbourne, so I am a little bit of a Victorian imposter. Um, but I did the last year of my immunology training here at Sydney, well, at Sydney Children's Hospital, and I completed that in 2016. Um, and since 2017, I've been undertaking a a PhD here at the Garvin Institute, uh, looking at a group of children with a rare uh, primary immune deficiency. And as part of that, I spent some time in Jerusalem recruiting patients and following them through diagnosis, treatment with conventional therapy and bone marrow transplants. So I gained a lot of uh, experience in that and am hoping to complete my PhD by the end of the year. Um, but every Wednesday, I work as a paediatric allergist at the Children's Clinic in Bondi Junction. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Um, so in terms of what I'll be talking about tonight, um, I'll be speaking about sort of firstly, what is COVID-19? And I promise I will make that quite brief because I've been told you've had a lot of talks about it. And I think we're all probably pretty familiar with the basics and have heard them to death. Um, then I'm going to be speaking about the immune response to COVID-19 because that's really important uh, in trying to understand some of these uh, disease uh, features that I'll be speaking about. Um, some of that will be a bit technical because it's hard to discuss it without being a bit technical, but hopefully I've made it uh, accessible because the immune system can be quite complicated. Um, then I'll briefly touch on COVID-19 in children and then talk about COVID-19 in Kawasaki disease or this multi-system inflammatory syndrome as it's now uh, being called. And at the end, I'll um, try and make it uh, as relevant as possible for you speaking about the role of the general practitioner in all of this. Um, so firstly, what is COVID-19? So the coronaviruses are a family of viruses that are common in human and animals and they can get passed along between animals, from animals to humans and humans to humans as well. Um, they are one of the largest RNA viruses. Um, they have spike proteins uh, on their outer surface uh, and various resources that I read said that uh, because those spikes look like a crown, that's why it's called coronavirus, but I also read that it's because of the solar, the similarity to the solar corona. Um, so I don't know, you can decide for yourselves. Um, there are seven human coronaviruses. Uh, the top four in that list there generally target the upper respiratory tract and cause about 15% of cases of the common cold. Um, and uh, then the bottom three, so SARS, MERS, and COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2, um, uh, lead to much more severe disease and target the lower respiratory tract. Um, so for this presentation, I'm probably mainly going to call it COVID-19 instead of SARS-CoV-2, but I may alternate uh, between the two, but I'll try to stay consistent. Um, so there's significant genetic similarity between COVID-19 and SARS, although there's greater genetic similarity between COVID-19 and um, a coronavirus seen in bats and also pangolins. Um, uh, the spread of the virus is primarily via droplets, but also uh, possibly via the fecal oral route, meaning incubation is four to five days and symptoms, as we're all familiar with, are either no symptoms at all, cough, fever, shortness of breath, muscle pains, impaired smelling, um, also ability to smell, um, and a chill blains like rash. Uh, in the hands and feet. Risk factors are older age, hypertension, obesity, um, being immune deficient or immune suppressed. Um, most patients who become symptomatic will do so within about 11 days and viral load reaches its peak about five to six days after symptom onset. Um, uh, the virus is very, very infectious, and uh, these are just um, some screenshots that I took uh, from a really useful website just showing um, the spread uh, worldwide of the virus between January and to March to uh, June of this year. 
Um, and now we're up to a stage where there are over 7 million cases worldwide, but I think we're very fortunate uh, to be in Australia where so far we seem to have successfully flattened the curve. And so a lot of what I'll be speaking about and a lot of the issues that arise um, with COVID-19, I think it's not that they're less relevant here, but I guess we can all, I guess, keep things in perspective uh, a little bit um, and realise how lucky we are here in Australia. Um, so that was uh, mainly what I wanted to say about uh, COVID-19. Um, so uh, because I am technically still a millennial, an elder millennial, but a millennial nonetheless, I uh, follow several medical related uh, Instagram feeds just for the odd dorky medical joke and what have you. Um, and this one uh, on the left of the screen came up uh saying that you know as well as the clapping for nurses and first responders and all the critical workers that we should all take a minute to appreciate the unsung heroes which are our are our immune cells um now i'm not so sure that eosinophils and basophils are that useful in fighting um coronavirus but uh the others certainly play a role um so uh, now I'm going to speak a little bit about uh, the immune system response to coronavirus and when we think about how humans uh, respond to viruses and why they become why we become unwell, why some people become more unwell than others, we have to think about both factors related to the virus um, and also host factors and how those two things interact. Um, so for example, you know, one of the risk factors I, miss, I, I mentioned before was older age, but you know, as I'm sure you all remember from the news reports, Prince Charles seemed to have bounced back much faster um, than Boris Johnson did uh, from his infection with the virus um, and did not become nearly uh, as unwell. So that's just an example. Um, of uh, taking virus and host uh, interactions into account and the mystery that remains about why some people become more unwell than others. Um, so this is where it might start getting a little bit technical. Um, so the coronavirus uh, has just under 30,000 uh, RNA bases that code it's thought between 25 and 29 uh, different proteins. The main protein that you've probably heard about is the spike protein, which binds to the A2 receptor, which is found in pulmonary cells. Um, but there are also a range of other proteins like NME, uh, the open reading frame proteins. Now, I'm not a virologist, so I'm not an expert as to why they're named, how they're named, or, or what exactly um, that means. But the reason why I included this slide is just to say that these proteins end up forming the antigens that the immune system subsequently uh, responds to and understanding those is very important uh, for planning our public health measures and also hopefully for uh, vaccine development. Um, so this is a really nice paper uh, that came out uh, recently in Cell and they pretty much always have nice papers. Um, and uh, it looked at uh, targets of um, the T cell uh, response uh, to coronavirus. Um, and so they used a bioinformatic approach uh, to create a large pool of epitopes or you know, antigens for both the spike protein and non-spike protein. And then they exposed the CD4 and CD8 cells of patients who had been diagnosed with COVID-19 and those who hadn't been diagnosed with COVID-19. So they had 20 um, uh, people in each group, so 20 people who were sick. Um, they weren't sick enough to need hospitalization and they collected blood from them about a month after their symptom onset and they um, confirmed either by viral swab or by PCR or by serology that they had indeed been exposed uh, to COVID-19. And they also used the blood of 20 healthy blood donors who had donated blood back between 2015 and 2018. So they shouldn't have had any exposure uh, to COVID-19. And then they basically uh, targeted the CD4 cells with various proteins, so spike and non-spike, um, and then looked to see what sort of cytokines the CD4 cells produced. 
Um, and they also wanted to see if the CD4 cell response correlated with the amount of IgG that was produced uh, against coronavirus. Uh, that's because CD4 cells play a helper T cell role, which I'm sure you'll remember, um, uh, and they help B cells make antibodies. So they wanted to see if there was a correlation between those two things. Um, they also looked at CD8 cells and stimulated them as well with spike and non-spike proteins. Uh, of the virus, and then they measured the subsequent uh, expression of different activation markers and cytotoxic granules because CD8 cells, as opposed to CD4 cells, um, so where CD4 cells, you know, act in a helper capacity, CD8 cells are um, much more, uh, they're effector T cells. So their role is to really attack and try to kill virus, kill bacteria. Uh, and attack any infected cells as well. So they release a lot of toxic uh, granules um, that are an important part of the immune response. And they also looked at cross-reactivity of these responses to other human coronaviruses. Um, so uh, I'll try to keep this slide simple. Um, so firstly, what they found in the top set of uh, graphs there, uh, they looked to see what, how much of an immunoglobulin response, so IgG, IgA, and IgM, was made to spike proteins. And you can see by, by the asterisks on the top that the increase in those immunoglobulins in COVID-affected patients was much, much higher, uh, was significantly higher than in the control group. So that shows that there is an immunoglobulin response, which is good. Um, and you can also see that there's an increase in the CD3, so the overall um, T lymphocyte response, uh, and that's in that second uh, set of um, uh, graphs. Uh, the response of CD4 and CD8 cells uh, wasn't uh, significant, um, and the response or the amount of B cells, um, this is on the lower uh, uh, graphs um, uh, was actually a little bit uh, decreased and there was no difference in monocytes. Um, so uh, when they looked at what the CD4 cells were actually responding to, they, um, so half of them, so the response to spike and non-spike proteins was about 50-50 and the TH, so the CD4 response was more of a TH1 response. So I'm not sure if you remember that the CD4 response can be more of a TH2 response, which um, uh, leads more to, to allergy and those sorts of things, or a TH1 response, which is more of a cytotoxic uh, response with more interferon gamma release. Um, the CD8 cells also responded in about 70% of patients, and they looked um, at their expression of interferon gamma, granzyme, and tumor necrosis factor. Those are, so those are some of those cytotoxic mediators I was talking about. Um, and they also, uh, in the last uh, picture on the right-hand side of the screen, um, they looked at that co correlation between CD4 and IgG titers to the receptor binding domain of the spike protein, and they found uh, that they do correlate, but for non-spike proteins, there was poor correlation. Um, and uh, I just put this in um, because they also found that patients who were unexposed to COVID-19 did also mount an immune response um, to some of the COVID-19 proteins, not as much and not all of the patients in that control group, but a number of them did. And they hypothesized that that's because of pre-existing immunity following infection with um, other coronaviruses. Uh, but they do note at the end that they would actually need to get those unexpo unexposed patients to be infected with COVID-19 to see if they really did respond uh, to those proteins in real life. So this was obviously just in the lab. Um, so, uh, so essentially what this study showed was that the adaptive immune system, T cells and B cells, they respond to COVID-19. They respond to spike proteins, but also to other proteins. Um, that B cells seem to make neutralizing antibodies predominantly to the spike protein, and that some people may have pre existing immunity. Um, this is a small sample size, and these were all non hospitalized patients, so uh, it might not, um, we might not get the same findings were we to look at very unwell patients in hospital. But it certainly provides uh, some reassuring data. 
Um, so that's a bit of background to what the immune system appears to be responding to and there's still a lot of research going on in that and we're still learning about that so don't take all of that as gospel but that's a good starting point. Um, so then I wanted to move on to the pathological immune response to COVID-19 um, and uh, this is also uh, from a nice uh, paper um, in Nature Reviews of Immunology um, which uh, shows that after the coronavirus enters respiratory cells after it binds, so respiratory epithelial cells after it binds to the ACE2 receptor, um, it starts to replicate and it leads to a process called pyroptosis, which is a highly inflammatory form of programmed cell death. That leads to a lot of cell death and a lot of vascular leakage and a lot of cellular debris and viral particles being presented to the immune system. So the immune system sees that and it goes, oh my God, what is going on? There's all this virus, there's all this cell damage, you know, we have to respond, respond, respond. Um, and so uh, T cells, um, alveolar macrophages, monocytes, they all come to the area, they start to get very, very excited and they then release their own cytokines like interferon. Um, and so you sort of get this positive feedback loop of more and more and more cytokines. So um, you don't need to know too much about these sorts of cytokines, but IL-1, IL-6, interferon gamma, IL-10, some of these are relevant for some of the treatment options that I'll talk about uh, in a few more slides. Um, and so you get this very inflammatory uh, sort of response. Um, and so in uh, the ideal scenario where you want a healthy immune response, uh, which you see on the left with a smiley face, um, is uh, that you would either get neutralizing antibodies that bind to the virus and inactivate it. Um, and for any virus that does actually infect cells, uh, of the respiratory tract that it would get cleaned up by mac uh, alveolar macrophages and also by CD4 and CD8 cells that they would get rid of the virus quite quickly before there's this really um, damaging inflammatory uh, response. Um, uh, but in a dysfunctional immune response, which you see on the right with the sad face, um, that doesn't happen and you get too much um, uh, inflammation and that can lead to the cytokine storm. Uh, that we recognize in pa some patients with coronavirus. Um, so one of the other hypotheses um, is that there are also antibodies that are not uh, actually neutralizing and that they might potentially cause what's called antibody dependent enhancement. Um, so I hadn't heard a lot about this before and found it quite interesting. Um, this is still a theory in COVID-19 and it hasn't uh, been shown or proven that it happens, but it is seen after vaccination um, to some strains of, of dengue virus, I believe, and it's also been noted in some uh, versions of coronavirus that are seen in cats. And so what happens is that um, if the virus can't infect certain cells because they don't have the ACE2 receptor, once antibodies bind to the virus, they can then um, attach to cells without the ACE2 receptor because antibodies can attach to other cells um, and the virus can enter that way. Um, uh, and you can see that on the picture on the left because when we make antibodies, yes, we make a lot of targeted antibodies um, to uh, to the virus or what have you, but sometimes we can also make uh, some slightly junk antibodies as well. Um, and in this case, they might be doing more harm than good. And then also um, what's shown on the right-hand side uh, is that that can lead to more activation of the complement system and again, more and more cell damage and inflammation and more cytokine release. Um, so again, this is just hypothesized as a possibility in COVID-19 but I thought it was just an interesting uh, mechanism. Um, so going back to the idea of there being viral factors and host factors, um, so starting on the left, you know, it may be that some patients just get a much higher viral load when they become infected with the virus. Um, the virus itself is able to evade the immune system. Some patients might have impaired immunity themselves or they might have lung disease or other pre-existing conditions. And then you get hyperactivation of the immune system, overproduction of cytokines and chemokines and too much inflammation. And that can then lead to multi-organ damage um, and some of these different inflammatory syndromes that have been described uh, in COVID-19. 
Um, so in terms of treatment options, um, all of these, you know, there'll be very excited articles and then media reports about some of them and everyone, you know, starts thinking, oh, we have to order this in at the hospital and then a few more studies come out and they're like, oh, actually that wasn't so useful. It seems to help some patients, not in others. So all of this should be taken with a degree of caution, but people are trialing certain uh, antiviral medications like remdesivir, uh, immune modulators, or immune suppressors, um, so uh, such as steroids, tocilizumab, which is an anti-IL-6, so trying to directly uh, target one of those cytokines that is driving a lot of inflammation. Um, also JAK inhibitors, um, so again, trying to put a break on that inflammatory response. Um, and then intravenous immunoglobulin or convalescent serum, um, and I think if we're honest with ourselves, probably the best option for treatment we have so far um, is in ICU or in other high uh, dependency units um, where we support the patient's respiratory and cardiovascular symptom until they eventually fix themselves. Um, but obviously we need to look for uh, some other options. Um, so that's a bit of background about firstly coronavirus, the immune response to it and how that immune response can um, become uh, hyperactive. Um, and, and so then looking at COVID-19 uh, in the pediatric population, initially when the virus appeared, you know, it seemed to be that, oh, well, you know, children don't get so unwell. Um, I had a lot of my friends calling me up say, oh, well, kids just don't get it. We're like, let them all go to school. Why aren't we letting them go to school? And there was this sort of national debate about whether kids should or shouldn't go to school um, and whether they pass it to adults or whether adults pass it to children. And so the largest uh, study of children um, uh, epidemiologically was done in China, in, in Wuhan, where the virus started. Um, and they looked at over 2,000 pediatric patients. Um, and what I've put in a box in red is just to show that the vast majority of them, uh, you know, looking at, you know, well over 80% uh, percent, uh, have either mild or moderate disease or are asymptomatic. So the vast majority of children don't become that unwell. And the majority of those who uh, did um, had similar um, sorts of symptoms to, to adults in the, the persistent fever, respiratory distress, uh, that kind of thing. Um, but then around about uh, sort of April, maybe early May, maybe a little bit earlier, um, there started to be reports coming out of um, uh, the UK, America and Italy uh, about children who were presenting with a hyperinflammatory disorder that was very similar to Kawasaki disease but um, in much greater numbers that we would normally expect. Uh, and uh, so this was actually reported by some paramedics uh, in England um, that over a 10 day period in mid April, uh, they had a cluster of eight children uh, with a hyperinflammatory shock syndrome similar to Kawasaki disease. They were all previously fit and well. Six of them were of Afro-Caribbean uh, background. Uh, the vast majority uh, were overweight, which is uh, also seen as a risk factor in adults. Most had no significant respiratory involvement, so that's quite different um, to most patients with coronavirus. Uh, seven ended up needing um, mechanical ventilation for cardiovascular support, um, so not for their um, respiratory disease. Uh, one actually died due to infarcts of the cerebral arteries, um, and four of them had had a known family exposure to, to COVID-19, but all of them were initially negative uh, to COVID-19 on PCR, so on viral swaps. Uh, two subsequently became positive, and you know, initially it was very hard to understand. It was like maybe they just had a bad case of regular Kawasaki. Is how do we know this is related to COVID-19? Maybe it's something else. Um, and like with a lot of the early literature that was coming out about COVID-19 and still today, a lot of the papers probably wouldn't uh, get through the publication pathway at a normal time. But I think everybody's just trying to get any data that they have out there. And the journals also feel that that's important. Um, so this was almost put out there kind of like a public service announcement, I think, to the medical community to say, look, we've noticed this. We don't really know what it's about. But if anyone else is seeing it, you know, please keep it in mind and share your data, which I think was the main benefit. But unfortunately, well, 
unfortunately or unfortunately, the media uh, also became aware of these reports and started publishing some very alarming headlines, you know, that children who are fit and well and then couldn't die really quickly and um, uh, people started to get uh, very nervous about this, both in the medical and non-medical community. Um, so I thought I would just go through a little bit about Kawasaki disease because I'm not sure how uh, familiar most of you are. Um, so it's named after the doctor who described it, so Dr. Kawasaki, who originally described 50 patients with this condition back in 1967. And he actually died last week. And I thought it was a little bit unfair that with all the talk about Kawasaki disease lately, that didn't make the news and no one seemed to uh, really notice that. But anyway, so a moment's uh, pause for, for Dr. Kawasaki. Um, but uh, Actually, the diagnostic criteria are a fever persisting for five or more days, uh, plus or minus um, uh, bilateral conjunctival uh, congestion, uh, lip and oral cavity changes, um, rash, uh, peeling or reddening um, of the hands and feet, um, and also non-pyrulent uh, cervical lymphadenopathy. Um, so you need to have uh, at least uh, five of those, um, but definitely number one uh, to be classified as having Kawasaki disease. Um, so these are just some pictures demonstrating that conjunctival injection, um, which is non-pyrulent. That's an important uh, diagnostic feature and this characteristic strawberry tongue appearance. Um, the cervical lymphadenopathy is often unilateral. Um, and uh, the membranous desquamation, which is also in addition to being um, in the hands and feet is also often in the perineal uh, area. Um, and that usually happens when patients are already getting better. Um, in Australia, we don't see a lot of children uh, who have had the BCG vaccine, but in countries where it is administered, children who get uh, Kawasaki disease um, have uh, been noted to get redness at the site of the BCG vaccine, which is interesting. Um, and this just lists some other features of the disease. I remember during my paediatric training, we learned that hydrox of the gallbladder is a very um, uh, um, specific early sign of the disease, but it's one that often uh, isn't picked up, um, and also a sterile, um, uh, sorry, protein urea. Um, so uh, Kawasaki disease, uh, so those were the clinical uh, criteria. It's an inflammatory syndrome of unknown etiology. Um, it's generally thought to be viral induced, but we're not sure which viruses. And um, it's one of, it's the most common primary vasculitis of childhood. Most children who are affected are less than five years old and most of them are Asian children and obviously it's um, particularly common uh, in Japan. And it affects the small and medium sized um, uh, blood vessels uh, and we particularly worry about the coronary vessels. It's actually a self-limiting disease that will get better on its own but if left to its own devices the mortality rate is very very high so we don't tend to uh, let it do that. Um, uh, the investigations for it are your classic uh, blood worker, blood culture to make sure that there's no um, uh, bacteria or that it's on a toxic shock syndrome or um, something uh, like that. Um, if you can, abdominal ultrasound, an ECG and obviously an echocardiogram, um, but the diagnosis is largely uh, clinical. Um, uh, the treatment is a two gram per kilogram dose of IVIG and some patients need a second dose if they don't, if their fever doesn't resolve within 36 hours after the first dose of IVIG. Um, and uh, in high risk cases for children who are already in shock or who don't do for best after IVIG, uh, steroids are often added in. Um, and children are also started on aspirin until they have a normal echocardiogram at their six week follow up. Um, so uh, this Kawasaki uh, like disease um, in children uh, now has more of a name. Uh, so in uh, Europe, they're referring it to it to it as PIMS TS. So unfortunately, not PIMS the drink. Um, maybe it's an immunology thing. I think a bit like Professor Peter Doherty, but. Um, uh, that stands for Pediatric Inflammatory Multi-System multi Syndrome, temporarily associated with SARS-CoV-2, which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, and the Americans are referring it to, for referring to it as MISC, so Multi-System Inflammatory Syndrome in Children. 
Um, and the CDC now has a case definition. So uh, it's any individual age less than 21 uh, years old presenting with fever um, of at least 38 degrees for more than 24 hours or a sub subjective fever lasting more than 24 hours. Um, laboratory evidence of inflammation, so looking at things like CRP, ESR, fibrinogen, ferritin levels, uh, if you can measure IL-6 levels, but that's a bit more complicated to do, um, as well as evidence of uh, clinically severe illness requiring hospitalization with more than two organ systems involved. Uh, there shouldn't be any other plausible diagnosis and um, they would ideally re return positive for COVID-19 either by PCR or serology or have a recognised um, contact uh, within four weeks of the onset of symptoms. Um, so uh, whilst the initial sort of reports of this disease were almost a bit anecdotal and uh, weren't really sure what was going on. A group uh, in France from the um, Necker Children's Hospital um, actually performed a prospective study. Um, and this is actually quite nice. So I thought I would um, just highlight it today. Um, so like I said, this was a prospective observational study. It was performed over 15 days uh, from late April to mid-May. Um, children needed to be less than ill. Oh, all patients recruited were less than 18 years old and they ended up recruiting 21 patients. Um, importantly, they note that the French lockdown started uh, more than a month before uh, the recruitment period and the parents of the children who were recruited stated that the guidelines were all followed. So these children were not at school, they weren't at childcare, they weren't going out anywhere, they were really just homebound um, and they were all previously well children so no history of a primary immune deficiency or or, or a sex or any kind of um, uh, immune deficiency um, and uh, none of them lived in unhealthy conditions or social housing um, uh, and 76% uh, of them had a BMI less than a 90th centile so these were not thought to be um, you know these obese uh, children where obesity is a risk factor for COVID-19. Um, so nine of them reported a recent viral illness, so headache, cough, coryza, a brief fever less than 48 hours. Only one of them reported uh, difficulty with their sense of smell, but the median duration between those viral symptoms and the onset of the Kawasaki-like symptoms was 45 days. It was really quite a while before they developed the Kawasaki-like symptoms that they had this brief viral illness. And you know, young children get sick quite a bit, probably less when they're not at school or not at daycare. Um, but it is something that you need to ask parents to to think back. Um, and almost 50% of them reported a recent contact with a family member displaying viral-like symptoms. And again, the mean duration between that contact and the onset of the Kawasaki-like symptoms was 36 days. Um, and so um, only eight were actually PCR positive for COVID-19 at presentation with, with their Kawasaki-type symptoms. Um, but eventually almost all of them were IgG positive to the virus. So they were able to show that these children did have exposure. Um, only um, one patient had symptoms of COVID-19 at presentation with the Kawasaki-like symptoms, and that was uh, anosmia, so not even one of the most common symptoms. Um, the majority were of an African background or had at least one parent who was from Sub-Saharan Africa or the Caribbean. Um, uh, 12 of them presented with a Kawasaki shock syndrome, including things like um, myocarditis with an elevated troponin, transient kidney failure, and most of them required uh, admission to the intensive care. Um, and interestingly, all of them reported gastrointestinal symptoms, and these were often the first presentation, and that started before the other symptoms of, uh, of Kawasaki disease. Um, they often developed acute abdominal pain, vomiting and diarrhea, and four patients even had a peritoneal effusion. Um, 20, so almost a quarter of the patients had um, mild coronary artery dilatation, um, but there were no uh, actual aneurysms, which is great. Um, most displayed right, raised inflammatory markers and lymphopenia and anemia uh, were common. 
um, all the patients survived, all of them received high dose IVIG, and almost half of them also required uh, steroids, and many were given broad spectrum antibiotics, which is not a surprise. And the average length of stay in hospital was eight days. So despite having to be in ICU, they actually didn't end up being uh, in hospital that long. And because there is such a delay, um, such a lag between when the children had their initial sort of respiratory symptoms to when they had their Kawasaki disease-like sim symptoms, um, it's thought that this is actually probably a post-viral immunological reaction um, to the virus or because of the virus and not actually that they're sick with the virus at the time that they have these symptoms. Um, and uh, there's also quite a few uh, features of, of this small cohort uh, of, of children that are quite different to uh, Kawasaki, children with Kawasaki disease. So usually the high risk population, like I mentioned earlier, uh, are Asian children. Um, and in this cohort, and also in that cohort from England that the paramedics reported, most of them were in an, from an African background. And a lot of people have hypothesized that some of that might be because of social housing or, or more people uh, living together in more community contacts. Uh, the authors made a real point of saying that this was not the case uh, for, for this population. Um, uh, they were also a bit older, so children with Kawasaki's are usually less than five years old, and this group uh, were sort of four to 17 years old. Um, a greater proportion uh, had incomplete forms of Kawasaki disease, so they didn't fulfill all the criteria. In Kawasaki disease, gastrointestinal symptoms are quite uncommon, uh, but in this cohort, all the patients uh, displayed them. Um, uh, there's more, uh, more cases of Kawasaki uh, shock syndrome, so needing um, uh, cardiorespiratory, uh, cardiovascular support. Um, and uh, inflammatory markers were even more increased than they would normally be um, in Kawasaki disease. Uh, lymphopenia, which is rare in Kawasaki disease, was quite common in this cohort. Um, and uh, yeah, the rest of it uh, is probably less. Um, sorry, the coronary artery dilatations and aneurysms were more common uh, in this uh, cohort. Um, so, like I said before, this is thought to be a post-viral immunological reaction, but the authors note some weaknesses of the study that this is a very small sample size. You know, this is 21 uh, children and there are over 7 million cases of COVID-19. So, we have to be really careful about saying, oh, this is what happens in, in, uh, in this feature. Uh, of the disease because a few months from now we might see many more cases which will completely change uh, the epidemiology and the clinical features. Um, but at the moment this was one of the um, best studies that, that, that I could find. Um, the authors also note that the NECA Children's Hospital is a tertiary referral centre so any COVID suspected children were going there. So there's also an ascertainment bias. There may be more children who have similar features but with much milder uh, disease who um, were either diagnosed with something else or didn't seek medical attention um, or you know were treated uh, as though they had uh, something else. Um, and they also know that this at the moment is very much a temporal association. And so whilst we think it's a post-viral immunological reaction, you know, association doesn't equal causation. So we don't really, we still don't know what is causing this, um, but these are the features that we're recognizing of the condition so far. Um, so in terms of the role of the general practitioner, because I think I'm coming to the end of my uh, allotted time, um, I think it's really important uh, to keep some perspective about this. I know the, the media and journals and people and parents uh, get very uh, nervous uh, when they hear about these sorts of conditions in children. You know, we sort of the media went from saying kids don't get sick, what's the problem? To oh my god, these kids can suddenly die, uh, which is obviously nerve-wracking. Um, but as far as I'm aware, so far in Australia, um, we don't have any cases of this condition and it remains very rare. Like I said, you know, there are over 7 million cases of COVID-19 worldwide so far that we know of um, and the proportion of children presenting this way is very, very, very small. Um, I think, you know, if you are seeing children who have uh, fever or 
um, other viral type symptoms, you probably will be seeing them by telehealth because I think these patients are meant to try and stay home at the moment. Um, so it might be hard to see, you know, if your internet connection's not so great or the webcam's not so good, whether they do have the, that redness of the eyes or redness of the hands and feet, you obviously won't be able to feel for um, cervical lymph nodes. Um, so uh, that does make things a bit difficult. Um, so it's really important to focus on the clinical history. And I think particularly asking about any potential contacts, gastrointestinal symptoms, recent um, upper respiratory tract symptoms, but also really asking about what was happening several weeks ago, not you know what's been happening over the last week, but really getting parents and if their kids are a little bit older to think back about what was happening um, a few weeks ago. Um, and essentially, you know, the, the main thing to do is refer these families to a paediatric emergency department because, you know, you may as well do the tests somewhere where they can treat them quickly because giving IVIG, you decide to give steroids, those things need to be done as soon as possible because that's correlated with much better uh, outcomes. So I think rapid referral um, to a paediatric emergency department and calling ahead to speak to the doctors in ED that this child uh, is on the way so they can prepare. Um, uh, and then I just wanted to uh, just briefly touch on uh, the clinic where I work. Um, so, because uh, that was what I really wanted to say about coronavirus and, and what we see in children and some of this aberrant immune response. Um, I know a lot of families are still uh, a bit afraid to come to clinics, but we are doing all we can to do temperature checks for everybody. Um, we're using hand sanitizer, masking and gowning. We've put up some screens for our receptionists. We're also able to do telehealth. So don't think that you can't refer to us for, for various things. Um, I made the receptionist team help me take a few pictures yesterday and the nurse actually performed some skin prick tests on me because I was worried I had dust allergy. Um, so as you can see, we've got the screens, we've got thermometers and really trying to do our best to keep everyone safe. And obviously we're telling any children who are unwell to stay home, which is meant, uh, like I mentioned, that we are doing more telehealth. Um, and then I just thought I would leave you with one of the other uh, side effects of COVID-19, which is some really good humor uh, as well. And some great uh, memes that I keep getting from friends uh, everywhere and then passing along. Um, so I thought I would end on that note. And now, if, um, I don't know, whether to stop sharing my screen um, and we've got some time for questions. Dr. Shadur, we have a couple of questions. Uh, one is, should yep. children with respiratory symptoms be swabbed for COVID-19? Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think the guidelines are anybody with um, even the milder symptoms uh, should still be checked because it's only by checking that one, that we know whether children well, or adults actually have the virus or not, but also that we get an idea of what carriage rates are and what infection rates are in the community. Um, and only if we have that information, I guess, if we know what the denominator is, um, can, can the government and the health authorities make appropriate judgments uh, as to how much we all need to stay in lockdown for? Another question I have is um, from somewhere, someone that is aware of an overseas case, a 40-year-old lady in good health with minimal symptoms since her diagnosis of COVID through contact in her church. Her swab tests remain positive two and a half months after initial diagnosis. Will she eventually recover? Can she become a chronic carrier? Um, I haven't seen any reports about people being chronic carriers um, and uh, th there have been reports about some people becoming reinfected, so having um, uh, first a positive swab, then a negative swab and then another, uh, then becoming unwell again, having recuperated between the two positive swabs. Um, it may be that she's still just carrying the virus in her um, naso, uh, in her nasopharynx, um, but I guess it would depend if she's still, you know, well or. Um, uh, but definitely, I mean, she should speak to, uh, you know, the infectious diseases or immunology team uh, in her area.
If there are any other questions, could people please send them through to us so that we can ask Dr. Shadur? If, uh, if there are any questions about the immunology slides, also feel free to ask because I wasn't sure if they were a bit too complicated or a bit too simple, um, but hopefully they were com comprehensible. I have another question here. Do we check for COVID in all children with wheezing and respiratory symptoms uh, as daycare needs it? Um, yeah, I think all children with symptoms. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we, I, I think the guidelines are anyone, whether it's children or adults with symptoms uh, should be should be assessed. Um, I mean, that's the, I haven't heard Gladys Berger say anything different. So I think those are still, uh, still the rules. Obviously, I mean, you know, for young baby, you know, for young babies and stuff, it is a pretty uncomfortable, I mean, for anyone, it's a pretty uncomfortable test. I had it done myself a few weeks ago because I had a bit of a cold and fortunately it was negative, but it's, it's not great fun. But yeah, again, I think it's only if we know what that denominator is, how many people are carrying it and how many people, you know, again, not only how many people have it in the community, but how many people have severe disease, how many people have mild disease. It's only if we know those sorts of things that hospitals can plan, that the health service can plan, that general practitioners can plan uh, for the present and for the future. So I think the more testing we're able to do, the better. I think one of the things we're really lucky maybe lucky is not the right word, but that we should all be very thankful that is available to us in Australia is uh, testing that's available to everyone at very high rates. Cause I you know, know a lot of people who live overseas that, you know, one of my friends, she uh, lives just outside London and she had a fever for almost three weeks and was feeling terrible. And, you know, obviously she had uh, coronavirus. She also lost her sense of smell and, you know, it was a bit short of breath and, the NHS clinic was like, no, don't come. So, you know, I don't think we can trust England's figures at all. Um, and so thankfully in Australia, you know, we, we've flattened the curve, we're able to test and that will, the more testing we do, the more we're able to inform public policy and, and sensible guidelines for the public. Thank you. Another question is, is the reason that Kawasaki has been reported only in children is because these children have been reinfected and as a result have a heightened immune response? Um, no, I don't think it's that they've, I mean, firstly, ultimately, we don't really know um, because it's all still very new. Uh, and I think that's important to keep in mind. I think the thinking so far is that um, uh, it, I guess in a way it's akin to the way that sometimes children who have a viral infection will get a swollen knee or they'll develop hives um, a little while later, you know, something to do with molecular mimicry or something like that, that something in the immune system when the children, when a small proportion of children <laughs> get this virus, um, that it kicks off something in their immune system that several weeks later uh, leads to this um, quite marked inflammatory response. And now the truth is, it's a difficult question to answer because um, one, we don't know definitively what causes Kawasaki disease in the first place. And so then trying to figure out what causes Kawasaki-like disease in COVID-19, where we also don't know that much yet, although I think we are starting to know more, is also quite a difficult question to answer. But it's probably not reinfection because the children are not displaying classical symptoms of an acute COVID-19 infection. They're not sort of, bad. they don't have respiratory symptoms uh, for the most, you know, uh, in almost all the cases with this Kawasaki-like disease. Um, so it's probably not reinfection. It's probably just that the initial infection has kicked off some kind of almost severe autoimmune um, re response uh, down the track. But that's all very much a hypothesis. Thank you. Uh, do you recommend a second swab if sim symptoms persist for over two weeks? Um, I think if they're exactly the same, probably not. Um, because if you have one positive swab and your symptoms don't change uh then no i mean i think if someone has symptoms 
and then they get better and then several weeks and then a few weeks later they get symptoms again they should probably be re-swabbed um, but I think if someone has persistent symptoms I mean this is a virus that's known to make people unwell for several weeks um, you know it's not like the common cold in some cases that you will recover after a couple of days you know I mean just speaking from my personal circle that friend of mine in the UK she was unwell for almost a month um, and you know she didn't need to go to hospital she wasn't hypoxic um, so there was no space uh, in the NHS for, for someone that was only what they deemed mildly unwell um, uh, but uh, yeah it is a disease that can keep you unwell for quite a while so they probably wouldn't need to be re-swabbed uh, but again I mean if there are questions about that then calling New South Wales Health um, or any of the testing centres they would also be able to give you guidelines. Another question does a child's level of vitamin D influence the likelihood of this complication from COVID infection given that vitamin D also has action on the same pathway as COVID does to enter the body? Yeah, I mean, I haven't seen anything about that for this particular manifestation of COVID-19. I think it's probably too early to say, you know, I mean, I think what I usually tell, you know, my patients is to just try and be vitamin D replete. Uh, and that seems to be a good thing. Um, but as to whether that, you know, I mean, I'm, there are 7 million people uh, in over 7 million people in the world with known coronavirus out that they're all vitamin D deficient. Um, so maybe a lot of people are vitamin D deficient, but um, you know, so I think just staying vitamin D replete, I don't think there's any good evidence of, of having super therapeutic levels of vitamin D uh, would help or prevent people getting the getting this disease. Um, and I think it's too early to say about exactly how it, it might be impacting this Kawasaki like I mean, you know, this cohort of patients was you know, only 21 patients. The reports, previous reports from England were uh, eight patients. The, a brief report from New York was 15 patients. You know, these are really small numbers. Um, so I don't think anyone has definitively uh, studied that yet. Another question, how will the vaccine developers know if the antibodies produced are junk antibodies? Um, yeah, so I mean, that's one of the the difficult uh, things. I mean, I guess, you know, they'll be measuring to see, I guess, you know, whether if, if first of all, someone gets a vaccine and they, then they become exposed to COVID-19, uh, whether they get, you know, they don't get the disease, they don't become unwell. I guess that would be the best real world test. Um, but I, I would imagine they would be looking at all sorts of um, you know, binding of the antibodies that that any patient who gets a vaccine develops, then looking to see, you know, taking blood from them again once they've made that antibody response and seeing what their antibodies actually bind to, um, which proteins of the virus that they're binding to, uh, and they would probably need to do that via ELISA or something in, in the lab uh, to see exactly uh, what that was acting against. But I, I did read some papers about that ADE phenomenon, and again, that's really, it's not proved in um, coronavirus, but that that might potentially make it difficult to develop a vaccine. Um, so I think we just need to wait and see. Um, yeah, time will tell. Uh, what is the youngest age that you can test for COVID? Uh, oh, that I'm actually not sure. I haven't seen any age limit. Um, I mean, there's definitely been, I think there was even a report of a neonate that uh, was diagnosed with it. And at that time, I don't think anybody was doing antibody tests. So I, I don't think that there's a limit. I've, I've not heard about any limit for, for testing. And could you please uh, clarify to everyone how to refer for specialist treatment if they have a patient with COVID-19? Oh, um, so I think, uh, you know, depending on where you are, I mean, the two, and again, being a bit of a Victorian imposter, um, the two 
paediatric uh, emergency departments that I'm mainly aware of would be Sydney Children's Hospital and also Westmead. And I know uh, from my colleagues at Sydney Children's Hospital that they have a dedicated COVID-19 section of the emergency department and a COVID-19 uh, sort of ward and stuff and are very ready. So I think referral to a tertiary centre would be the best option. Um, and the way to do that is to just call the emergency department and say, hi, my name is whatever it is, uh, I'm a GP out in wherever, um, I've been contacted by this family or I've seen this patient who has this symptom, I'm worried about COVID-19 or COVID Kawasaki-like disease and I want to send them in. Um, and, you know, depending on how unwell the child is, whether they need to go by ambulance or the parents can drive them there. Um, but giving the hospital a heads up, I think, is a good thing just so that they're not sitting in triage or something like that. But calling up and asking to speak to the senior clinician or the senior triage nurse in the emergency department uh, would be the way to go. And if you're having trouble getting on uh, to them, then I think uh, the senior paediatric registrar who's on call for the day uh, or the infectious diseases um, uh, team would be your other option. But probably starting with the emergency department is easiest. They'll call everyone else really quickly, I'm sure. I think that looks like all the questions we have. Oh, hang on, there's just one more now. Why has testing methods changed to both nostrils and throat? As swans are so hard to, sorry, should be swabs, are so hard to collect in kids, are we risking missing diagnosis? Um, uh, to be honest, I'm not sure. Um, I mean, my understanding was that they had to be like through the nose and down the back of the throat. Um, it is hard to do in kids, but it's definitely possible. Um, so I, yeah, I wasn't actually aware of that change, um, but I can uh, look into it um, and, and feedback. Okay, I think that's all the questions we have at the moment. So thank you very much for presenting tonight. It's been very interesting and very educational. So thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you again for having me and um, yeah, happy to hear you know some feedback down the track. I hope it was uh, interesting and useful for everyone. Thank you. Good night, Bella. Uh, I now Thanks. would like to um, introduce Dr. Martina Gleeson. My, Dr. Martina Gleeson is the clinical lead for General Practice South Eastern Sydney Health Pathways and she will be doing a Health Pathways demonstration. Please welcome Dr. Gleeson. Hi there. Um, I'm assuming you can see my screen now. So um, I'm having the same problems as Bella in terms of, sorry, just bear with me. I'm gonna focus on that. Okay. So, you can see um, the screen. great. Thanks very much for that, Susan. So, um, Hi and welcome. Uh, I am Martina Gleeson. I'm a GP in Carring Bar in southeastern Sydney. I've been in Carring Bar for about 20 years and I'm also the GP clinical lead of the southeastern Sydney Health Pathways Project. Um, I'm going to be presenting uh, some things in both our Health Pathways and the Sydney Health Pathways um, to s help you use our pathways uh, to support your treatment of um, patients uh, who might be uh, experiencing COVID-19 infection and also to see how some of our other general pathways might support you in the same thing. Um, I'm showing you uh, login details for the South Eastern Sydney Health Pathways at the moment and if you haven't logged in before, um, if you take a photo of this uh, that'll give you your login and it, um, the QR code will also take you to the website. Um, the website that it takes you to is the mobile friendly platform and if you prefer, prefer to see um, the pathways the way I'll be presenting them today, you can choose the classic interface instead. And I'll also share with you the Sydney Health Pathways login. Uh, their username and password are slightly different to ours. Um, Sydney Health Pathways has been uh, producing health pathways for about three years longer than us. So they have um, a lot more pathways, uh, but um, the 
probably the main difference is when you get down to identifying the resources for your area, Sydney Health Pathways um, is for the Sydney Local Health District and our Health Pathways are for the South Eastern Local Health District. So you can choose whichever one is most appropriate for where you work and the resources that you need to find. So today I want to introduce you to Health Pathways. I'm assuming that quite a few of the attendees have used Health Pathways before, but that also there might be some novices. So I'm just gonna try and pitch it at both of you, um, both types of user. Um, you can see this is the home page, the landing page, and uh, you can see over here on the right, uh, what pathways have been updated or what new pathways we have. Uh, there's also um, on the front page some, if there's some really important health system news that's just come up recently, we'll try and post it on the front page. So uh, you probably are dealing with the changes to the PBS listing of the opioid medications this week. And uh, so um, Sydney have, um, added a link to the changes to help you find your way around uh, what feels like a big mess at the moment. Um, over here on the left hand side you've got a, a table of contents and um, you can see that there are a number of different um, COVID-19 pathways. Um, <clears throat> the pathways for COVID-19 have been developed um, quite unusually for Health Pathways, rather than by a local team, it's been a big collaborative effort between all of the Health Pathways teams in New South Wales, with the main clinical pathways being single sourced from Hunter New England. And then the uh, pathways with more local information being worked on by the local teams. And this has been a very deliberate uh, uh, decision so that uh, Health Pathways users get um, consistency of message and also it means that uh, the Ministry of Health and the infectious diseases physicians really only need to deal with one editor um, and they can rely on that editor getting the information out to all of the different health pathways so that we're not um, out of date. Uh, we often even get the heads up that something's about to change before it's announced so that we have the opportunity for all of our health pathways to be updated pretty much within hours or sometimes even before uh, changes have been announced by the Department of Health. That was really relevant um, in March um, and April, but as there is less and less change, thankfully uh, less and less updates needing to be done. So uh, just a brief introduction to some of the COVID pathways. Uh, there's an information pathway which has got links to um, international information, federal government information, state government information and local information. It's kind of like just a place to put a whole lot of things if you're looking for more information. Uh, there are assessment and management pathways. So the initial assessment management, initial assessment and management of someone who's presenting with possible COVID symptoms uh, and then the ongoing assessment and management for patients who are proven to have COVID-19. Um, the clinical management and also um, what your local area is doing <clears throat> to look after them and, and who your resources are if you have a patient that you've diagnosed with COVID-19, uh, which you're likely to have done if you sent them to a private, private lab for their test. Uh, there's also COVID-19 requests, and I think I've already opened that up. Yep, here it is. So that's actually where to find uh, the information that you need, uh, respiratory assessment. Um, and so maybe you want to send your patient to a GP respiratory clinic because you don't have enough at PPE at your place to see the patient and they need to be seen. And so if you click on that, you can find in the Sydney area, the GP respiratory clinics. And if you say you are tuning in from Belmore today, you can actually find out um, how to access the Belmore Respiratory Clinic and uh, what the details are, how to contact them. So all of that information is there. They've also got a separate listing for swab testing, including where to send children, um, which is basically the Sydney Children's Hospital. And identifying private testing centres, who to notify. Obviously we know it's the PHU, but there's their phone number for you. 
Um, if you've got a patient who's going to need community monitoring in Sydney, it's the Royal Prince Alfred Virtual Hospital. Uh, who to call for advice and then how to get PPE. Um, we've also got some pages on practice management and telehealth and the impact on local services is about um, outpatients and other services, how they've been impacted, what changes have affected. And a really useful one is the recent changes page because it, um, you, if you're logging on probably once a week, have a check and go, well, what's changed in the COVID pages? Is there anything I don't know about? Um, and so you can screen through, if you've already read through the pathways and you're fairly familiar with them, you can go, okay, well, the practice management one hasn't changed since the 6th of May, but look at that, the, uh, the initial assessment and management, there's a slight edit that happened just yesterday. So maybe you'll go and have a look at that and see what that change is. Um, and so it just gives you a good way of checking up uh, the changes that have been made to the COVID pathways without having to scan through all of the pathways and see if you can pick up any differences. Um, I just want to let you know also that uh, we have some other pathways coming, um, even though we seem to be flattening the curve. Uh, we're still preparing, I guess, for a possible second wave and uh, wanting to have the resources there for you should you need them. So um, I'm told on uh, good authority that Sydney have uh, management in RACF's page that should go live tonight. So it should be available for you to view tomorrow. And they also have um, one for management in children on its way. Uh, and we have the RACF one coming as well. Uh, not as imminent as Sydney, and we also are developing a disability support in COVID-19 uh, pathway, which will give you a lot of resources to help uh, people living with disability whose usual supports are affected by the pandemic. So on to how do I use health pathways to help with Kawasaki disease? Um, I wanted to show you that you can actually use the search bar rather than trying to just take you back here rather than trying to guess in the table of contents where it might be and you could go into child and young adult health but you really wouldn't be able to guess what search what you know where that might be just in a heading so if you were to type kawasaki into the search bar like i did here um, it identified that there are three pathways that have got a mention of Kawasaki. And probably the best one to go to is going to be Rash in Unwell Children. So I clicked on that and set it up because for you already because my internet's a bit slow. Um, and you can see here, uh, we're on the Rash in Unwell Children page. And right at the top, there's quite a few of our clinical pathways that are not COVID pathways that might have a COVID-19 note on them. And because Kawasaki, like illness, can present with a rash, uh, we've put a note there saying uh, to be alert to the potential signs of the Kawasaki disease. You can see that little box with an arrow in it. And that means that if you click on that link, it's going to link you to an external source. And the source that it links you to is the Sydney Children's Hospital Network information about Kawasaki disease. Um, Dr. Shadur has just uh, made it quite clear to us that the um, illness that children are getting overseas after COVID in very small numbers is a Kawasaki-like disease rather than actual Kawasaki disease, but it's still a reminder uh, to consider this and this gives you a basic idea of some of the things that you'll find. Uh, like all pathways, you might find a red flag section. We try to keep red flags uh, to a minimum, but you know, most of us would know that if we see a child with a fever in particular, that's a very important thing not to miss and it's probably something that we should be shifting into the hospital system via ambulance very quickly. Um, uh, you will often get a bit of background about the clinical situation that the pathway is talking about in this case, rash in children. Uh, and then all health pathways um, are moving towards uh, the same structure. So all of our clinical pathways should have an assessment part, uh, a management part and a request part. 
the request is Health Pathway Speak for referral. So, and the idea is to try and make them easy to scroll down so that you can quickly go to the bit that you're interested in without having to scroll through lots and lots of information. So in this case, we know that Kawasaki disease presents with a more biliform rash. So obviously they say to observe the child, uh, usual childhood observations uh, suggest what history you might want to take. Um, you might have already done that. You've already done your assessment and you're thinking this might be Kawasaki disease. What more do I need to know? And you might not need this information, which is why it's nested in drop down boxes so that you can find what you need, but not have to go through all of the details. Uh, reminds you what examinations that you should be looking for. And then I'm not gonna go through all of the rashes here because uh, the idea is for you to realize how health pathways can be something that you can access. Um, for yourself and, and use it as a tool. Um, but if we go through the macular papula or morbilliform rash, which is how the Kawasaki disease rash usually presents, um, it suggests the, num the different rashes or different causes that you might consider. Uh, and in the middle of this, you'll find Kawasaki disease. And if you open that up, it actually explains some of the things that Bella's already explained to us today that for Kawasaki disease, the peak incidence is in young children under five, particularly Asian children. Although now we know that in the Kawasaki-like illness with COVID, it's um, old children older, up to 10 and Africans. Uh, and gives you an idea if, of what really to look for, uh, especially with Kawasaki disease, the fever for over five days, and then the signs below to look for the rash, the oral signs, the eye signs, um, swelling and erythema of the hands and feet, peeling of skin around the fingernails as they recover, cervical lymph node enlargement, abdominal pain. Um, and also, if you click on this, it'll take you to some photos that might help you confirm in your own mind that this is this may be what you're looking for. So you've done your assessment and you're thinking, I think this might be Kawasaki disease, what do I do now? Um, and so you go down to the management and it sort of tells you the serious cases that you should be considering actually sending straight off to the emergency department. And in this case, Kawasaki disease is one of those uh, serious unwell child with rash illnesses that we shouldn't try and soldier on with on our own, but should be availing ourselves of the local emergency department with a paediatric um, facility that's available to us. Uh, and then, so the ongoing management is for um, people that you're not managing at home. But for example, we know that Kawasaki disease is a vasculitis, uh, so is henoch schönlein and both of them are suggested that you actually send them to hospital. So then how do I do that? Well, I go down to request and I click on the urgent paediatric assessment in emergency department page, and that will actually take me to this page in Sydney, which gives me um, access to all of the um, emergency departments in the Sydney Local Health District that have a paediatric department. Um, so information about um, all of those. And uh, the Southeastern Sydney has a similar page. I'll show you that in a middle, in a minute. Actually, I might show it to you right now. So this is uh, Sydney Health Pathways and you can see it looks fairly similar, but uh, the we have different updates and we haven't actually um, put anything about the opiates uh, changes on ours. Um, those alerts are up to individual teams and to be honest, I hadn't thought to put it up. Uh, we have the same COVID pages. Um, ours, one of our request page looks a little bit different uh, simply because um, it's a local area decision to decide um, how to organise the um, the pathways to help people find. So we actually decided that we wanted to identify the drive-through uh, services separate to the um, to the office-based services and the hospital-based services that people needed to could use. Um, so you can look through all of the 
um, clinics there. Uh, but if you want to go, if the, you want to direct a patient to a drive-through, it can help you identify the drive-through clinics available in the southeastern Sydney district. And um, some of them are publicly provided services, and some of them are private. So, and some of them have a co-payment. So, um, and this will give you. Uh, the information, all of that sort of information about co-payments and how the patient accesses that service. Um, it also lists the GP respiratory clinic separate to the GP testing clinics because there does seem to be two different style. Um, in southeastern Sydney, uh, we don't have the RPA virtual, so um, our area has uh, the telehealth assessment clinics and they are for managing patients who are identified as having the coronavirus infection. And um, so this gives you the information about what those clinics do and um, how to contact them if um, they haven't already been contacted. The main people you would be um, contacting them for, as I said, would be uh, patients that you've identified through having them tested privately because if they've been identified through the local health district, it's very likely that the, um, the CTAC clinic will have been in contact with the patient or the PHU before you even know that they've got coronavirus, especially as the um, results seem to be taking a while to come through to us. And then we've also got the telehealth and um, where to get advice and the access to PPE um, on our site. And again, that's the recent changes um, and the acute paediatric general medical assessment, which is the equivalent of the uh, paediatric emergency assessment that you saw on the Sydney page. Um, and they will, you know, it, it gives you a list of criteria to give you an idea of who you should be sending. But if you're worried and it's your, it's your sense that this patient should be seen in the emergency department, don't let this criteria, uh, if don't let the child not meeting those criteria stop you from sending them if that's where you feel you need to do because we are specialists in our rights and we can make those decisions. And so then you've got um, the emergency departments that see children, um, including St George Hospital, which has a paediatric section and the Sutherland Hospital and uh, the Sydney Children's Hospital, obviously, with their uh, contact details. So, I mean, we all know where our local hospitals are, but sometimes you just don't have that magic phone number. And uh, so it's helpful to um, have that number, be able to go to a pathway and find that number straight away and uh, be able to get on the phone and talk to someone. Um, there were some questions for Dr. Shador about, um, about children with respiratory symptoms. Do we need to test them? What should we be doing for them? And uh, this is a particularly challenging thing for GPs to be managing with. There's a lot of rhinovirus around at the moment and there's increasing influenza around. Um, and at the moment, we in general practice because we get undifferentiated presentations. Uh, a lot of the time we don't know if this is a coronavirus or a rhinovirus child that their parent wants us to see and help them with working out what to do. Um, and I just wanted to let you know that uh, the Health Pathways teams are involved with um, putting together a list of clinical scenarios uh, that involve things like a child with a runny nose, uh, and a mild fever um, and to get the advice of the public health uh, and the Ministry of Health for what GPs um, should be considering doing for these presentations to try and give us a little bit of clarity. Uh, it's challenging because there isn't necessarily strong evidence one way or the other. There's our public health requirements like what Bella was saying about um, giving us a good idea of the denominator and um, making sure that we don't have a lot of community spread. If we're not testing, we're not going to pick up community spread. Uh, but also we're really trying to develop some pragmatic answers uh, to those questions uh, so that um, those of us who work as GPs as well as Health Pathways Editors 
have answers for ourselves and we can um, also support our colleagues by um, developing those answers and putting them on health pathways. So watch this space because that's something we've been working on for a while, um, advocating for and uh, have the support of the RACGP in trying to find some answers. So uh, that's possibly slightly shorter um, than what I was asked to speak, but um, that's the end of what I decided that I planned to share. So uh, I'd welcome any questions. Thanks, Dr. Gleeson. Um, if you do have any questions, please type them and send them through and we can, um, we can ask them. So we'll just wait to about a minute to see if anything comes through. And we can send out um, the login details for both South East Sydney Local Health District and the... Uh, yes, so I will just um, go back. So that's the Sydney Health Pathways uh, login and, um, and connection. And I'll show the South East and Sydney one in a minute, just while we're waiting to see if there's any questions. Okay, I've got a question come through. What is the quickest way to access Health Pathways while consulting? The quickest way to access Health Pathways while consulting is to set up a shortcut in your um, in your clinical software package. So, um, in Medical Director, you have little buttons down the bottom right hand part of the screen and you can um, set up links to external um, websites. So uh, some of the links that I have used are the Australian CV Risk Calculator and the Oz Diab Risk Calculator and one of my links is Health Pathways. Um, the alternative is to set up a shortcut on your browser, on your web browser. Um, now there is a section here on the front page of the Health Pathways site. In the About Health Pathways section, there is a, a link to how do I add Health Pathways to my desktop. And it gives you information on how, what's the quickest way to get to the home page, um, how to add shortcuts to your computer desktop or to your, um, web browser. Unfortunately, best practice doesn't allow you to add a shortcut at the moment, as far as I know. Uh, but you can, if you use MedTech 32, you can add a shortcut and MedTech Evolution. So as we become aware of being able to add links from within your clinical software package, um, we will uh, share them on this part of the website. Uh, so if best practice lets us do it, we'll definitely put that information up. Um, the other thing is you can save it as a, a button on your um, mobile phone. So if you uh, do house calls or nursing home visits, um, saving a link to Health Pathways on your phone so that you can just click straight onto that um, when you're out and about and mobile and don't have access to your desktop. That's another tip that I have for you. Great, thank you. How often are the um, COVID pathways been updated? They've been updated as things have developed. So um, it, it, like they were being updated daily and sometimes hourly right at the beginning of the pandemic, honestly. Um, but as things have stabilised, uh, there's been less need for update. But any time the advice changes uh, from the New South Wales Department of Health or the Federal Department of Health, uh, the clinical editor who's working on the, um, the initial assessment and management page and the ongoing assessment and management page, she gets the heads up straight away and the health pathways are edited immediately. So um, you can really rely on them to be as up to date as any of the other health websites um, as in departmental health websites that you would be accessing, but hopefully in a, um, a format that is more user-friendly and more aware of how a GP works. Okay, um, another question is, knowing that there is a lot of rhinovirus around, are we testing all the children with runny nose and cough for COVID-19? Well, I am. 
<laughs> um, it's like it's it's difficult, isn't it? Uh, we don't really want to be forcing children to have tests, and if our practice was to uh, personally do all of those tests, we'd run out of PPE pretty quickly. We have got quite a lot of PPE, but probably not enough for all of the rhinovirus. Um, uh, we're not testing so that we can give people a clearance from the point of view of saying you don't have COVID so you can go back because the information is still that you should um, stay home until you're well and that includes keeping children home from childcare or, or school until they're well uh, because of the chance that the test they had was a false negative um, or that they had a coexisting rhinovirus and coronavirus. But yeah, at the moment, the advice is test, test, test. And even if you think it's rhinovirus, test. Okay. Um, do all the drive-through testing sites test for children, test children? No, they don't all test for children. Um, some of some of them do. So the, I know that the Hurstville community one does uh, test for children. I think it's over five. Um, even not all of the hospital ones test children. So Sutherland Hospital tests children. St George Hospital Testing Centre tests children, I think, over five. And under five, they get tested in the emergency. They get assessed and tested in the emergency department. Um, you probably need to check with your uh, local private pathology provider. Um, I know that the one near me is happy to test, test children. Um, so, so yeah, it is a, a little bit of a matter of um, either checking the details in the request page or um, ringing the one that you want to use and seeing if they'll test children. Um, I think that they're going to be seeing a lot more children in the next little while as winter colds start impacting on our practice. I think that might have been the last. Oh, hold on. Uh, will that be listed in health pathways in the future? The children's testing? Yep. Um, well, I think I, I showed that um, Sydney does have in their, let me just go back to that, in their requests, they basically said on theirs, um, just under children's COVID testing centres, they said Sydney Children's Hospital. Um, I haven't read through their private testing, so I'm not going to take you to that one. Uh, but certainly in the um, southeastern Sydney request page, um, we have listed that the Hurst for one, where are we testing? We've listed that the Hurst for One assesses children um, aged over five years. There you are. You can see that there. Can, am I still sharing my um, my screen? screen? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you can see that that is listed there. But we haven't listed it as a separate thing. Now, that's uh, a really helpful question. Thank you for asking that, whoever it was. If you're um, looking at a page and you're, you've got some feedback, and that feedback might be, we would find it really helpful for you to list um, list the uh, where I can specifically send children for testing. There's a little button button up here on the right hand corner that says send feedback, and if you click on that, um, you can either click on it from the home page or you can click on it from the page that you were using and feeling that there was an improvement, or or even maybe we got something wrong or um, or thank you very much, it was really helpful, whatever. If you want to give us some feedback, if you click on that button, it will take you to a feedback form and uh, you can um, make a request and uh, we'll, we respond to all of the feedback that we get. Um, sometimes we have to have a little bit of a chat to see uh, what we can do about the feedback. Uh, it has um, precipitated us uh, prioritising development of some new pathways because of feedbacks and requests that we've received and certainly um, has resulted in edits to pathways to make them more user-friendly. We This is a website for GPs and we really want it to be user-friendly for GPs. So if you've got any suggestions for improvement, we're really happy to consider them and do what we can to meet your needs. 
Okay, and just one last question is, do all the results um, from these clinics, or sorry, are the, are the results from all these clinics communicated back to the GP, including COVID results and rhinovirus? <laughs> That's an interesting question, and it really depends a bit on your LHD. There's been a lot of it advocacy at a lot of levels, um, like right up to the CEO of the PHN, as far as I know, with the local health districts and the local and the public hospital run clinics to make sure that uh, GPs get results um, with varying success. Um, I think the Sydney local health district is doing a little bit better than the South East and Sydney local health district, although I have started noticing some results coming through on my patients from our local hospital clinic. So I hope that that's a sign of improvement. Uh, obviously, if you order uh, a test through a private lab um, and send the patient to the one of the designated collection places, or to, then you should definitely get that result. Uh, we have a drive-through clinic in our area that is um, a collaboration between a GP and a pathology company and uh, the GP has taken my feedback and is now ensuring that even if he writes the request form because the patient hasn't arrived with one from their own doctor that he will include their GP in the results. Um, so it, it really depends a little bit on um, on the individual clinics. Um, all I can do is suggest to you that if you're not happy with those results not coming back to you, that you contact the person who did the test and let them know that you're not happy uh, because uh, our colleagues are responsive to feedback. Um, and the L if the LHD keeps hearing from disgruntled GPs that they're not getting told their results of their patients, they might actually do something. There are some systemic issues. It's uh, the systems that the clinics are using, the actual IT systems they're using are not very user friendly for adding the name of the patient's usual GP. Um, and I'm not sure how New South Wales Health copes, but I do know that the name of the usual GP is now recorded in the South Eastern Sydney electronic health medical records. So it really shouldn't be too much of a problem to get us results. Great, thank you. Um, and that was the end of it. So thank you very much, Martina. Um, and thank you, Dr. Shadu, for presenting tonight. Um, thank you, everybody, for attending. You will receive the evaluation link in your email inbox. So please complete the evaluation um, and send that through. And we hope to see you online soon. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you.